Yeah. Either all that right. or much longer, because once I got on the floor, I wouldn't yeah. be able to get out. Yeah, you help help us all up. Yeah, getting down is no problem. Yes. Getting up. We've been going now. We're in trouble. So thanks, everyone, for being here again. Um, obviously, we're back for a little bit more epic, Lesson 16. So we're going to be covering the Catholic Reformation Part 2 today. Uh, so for those that might need a little bit of a refresher, we are in the gold time period. You'll see it on your timeline chart, the Catholic Reformation. So the years we're covering are 1545 to 1699. In the first half of this lesson, which we did last time, uh, we talked about, you'll remember, the Council of Trent. We also talked a lot about what happened in England, King Henry VIII, uh, Elizabeth, Mary, and whatnot. So a lot of uh, political back and forth with what was going on um, in England and yeah, obviously had a big effect on the church at large. So during this time period, we're going to be talking about uh, some more interesting things. This is a time period, and in fact, if you look on your, uh, if you have your uh, bookmarks, it'll tell you um, what, why we are in a gold period. This is Holy Saints reform the church. So if you'll recall, we came through a time period of protesters and defenders. That was our orange time period. And as a result, the Catholic Church responds to what those protesters had to say, and that's why the Council of Trent occurred, and that's also why during this time period we see uh, what the Catholic response is to that. So we'll see um, a lot of saints and scholars that come forward that help reform the church and move the church in a direction of, um, of holiness. So uh, we'll be talking about St. Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, we'll be talking about the Battle of Lepanto as well, which is an absolutely critical battle in the history, not just of the Catholic Church, but of Christianity at large. And so it's that's a really interesting thing to, to learn about. Um, so before we get into that, though, of course, we would like to start with a prayer. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here again in your name so we can learn more about you and your church and all those who have come before us and passed on the faith of Christ to us. Lord, we thank you for the church that we have. We thank you for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us through your church. And we ask that you would help us to learn and to grow in our faith as we learn about your church. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for our family and friends. We ask, Lord, that you would fill us with your love, that you would energize us so that we may take your love to all those who need it in this world. We thank you, Lord, for all of these things, and we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, um, any questions before we get started on previous time period or anything else uh, you know, as we've moved up into, we're obviously getting into the, the later part of the class here, getting close to the end. Um, so any questions on protesters and defenders or the first part of uh, the last lesson with the Catholic Reformation, anything else? No, doing pretty good? Okay. Uh, so what we'll do, as always, we can go through, and I will read from the Establish the Context. This is on page 85 of my book, should be the same with yours. And we'll, cover, we'll go over what we're going to be covering today. Dominican, Franciscan, and Jesuit chaplains were scattered throughout the fleet. Every man was given a rosary. The papal legate blessed the ships and the men. The Holy League fleet, 208 war galleys strong, under the command of Don Juan, left the harbor to seek out and destroy the menacing Muslim fleet bent on conquering Rome. The Ottoman Turks marauded through the Mediterranean throughout the 16th century. They conquered the islands of Rhodes from the hospital hospitaliers in 1522. Their war galleys were the scourges of the sea, raiding, pillaging, and capturing Christians for use as galley slaves. The Muslims also advanced over land, striking deadly blows in Hungary and besieging the gates to Europe, Vienna. The very existence of Christendom was threatened. Selim II, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, prepared his forces for an attack on Rome itself, referring to the Eternal City as the Red Apple, because he considered it ripe for plucking. Pope St. Pius V sent letters to all the monarchs of Europe, seeking help against the Turks. 
Only the Spanish responded positively, crafting a delicate alliance between Spain, Venice, and, and his own papal states, St. Pius V formed the Holy League and placed Don Juan of Austria at the head of the largest Christian fleet ever assembled. Don Juan knew the difficulty of his charge. He was sent to find and destroy the Muslim fleet. The illegitimate son of the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, was a mere 24 years old when the fate of Christian Europe was placed on his shoulders. Leaving the Christian galleys to the Gulf of Lepanto, he engaged the enemy fleet on October 7, 1571. Although outnumbered, the Christian fleet, aligned in the form of a cross, experienced a miraculous change of the wind at the crucial moment of the battle and defeated the crescent-formed Muslim fleet, destroying and capturing more than 200 galleys to the loss of only 12. Christendom was saved. In Thanksgiving, the Dominican Pope, with a great devotion to Our Lady, proclaimed October 7th as the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, later changed and still celebrated as the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. The reform of the Church, spurred on by the decrees of Trent and the actions of Pope St. Pius V, was furthered through the lives of several great holy men and women. St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross undertook the reform of the Carmelite Order, providing the Church with holy communities of men and women whose prayers uplifted and sanctified the Church. St. Charles Borromeo, the Archbishop of Milan, provided an authentic witness of reform in his diocese, establishing seminaries and fostering holiness among his priests. St. Philip Neri presented a life of holiness in the heart of the Church. The witnesses of, a witness of his simple holy life and his founding of the Oratorians gave Rome an example of holiness that attracted many priests and laity. Holy men and women were sent throughout the world as missionaries to Protestant lands, the Far East, and the New World in order to invite those who had left the church to return and to take up the gospel to places where it had never been preached before. Unfortunately, the colonies in the New World participated in the heinous sin against human dignity, slavery. The church was not silent, as pronouncements from popes, as well as exhortations from hardworking and saintly missionaries, promoted the dignity of every human person and called for the abolition of the slave trade. Jesuit missionaries braved severe conditions and ruthless Iroquois to bring the good news of Christ to the inhabitants of North America. They witnessed among the peaceful Hurons in the region of modern-day upstate New York and Quebec. St. Isaac Jogues, was captured by Mohawks and brutally tortured, losing several of his fingers. He escaped and made his way back to France, where he requested to return to North America to continue to work. Captured once again, he was martyred for the faith in a village nestled amidst the idyllic Mohawk Valley. His death was not in vain, for the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Christians. Ten years after his martyrdom, a future saint of the church was born in the same village, Kateri Tekawitha. The reform was producing results and the Christian and, and the church had regained some of her lost respect and credibility when an event that would affect her for centuries occurred. A professor of mathematics at the University of Padua believed he could prove the theory initially proposed by Nicholas Copernicus that the earth revolved around the sun. Although that was the scientific basis of Galileo's thought, there was something much more important at stake. The question of what explains reality, science, faith, or both? Galileo's real theory was the advancement of the notion that science alone could explain reality. He attempted to answer a metaphysical question with a physical response, and this caused him to run afoul of Pope Urban VIII. Less than 50 years after the Galileo affair, Christendom's experience was once more threatened by the Ottoman Turks, who once more besieged the great city of Vienna. Polish forces under King Sobieski rescued the church, or rescued the city on a date that should be among the most famous in history. Despite this miraculous rescue, the church was faced in the next century with a more insidious enemy that very nearly destroys her. So, again, plenty going on in, in this lesson, and Lepanto will be a big part, though. So, this way we go.
and welcome back to Epic, a journey through church history, a 2,000 year study of the history of our great Catholic Church. I want to thank all of you for being with us here today, and those listening on the audio or watching at home on the DVD, thank you for being with us. We're continuing our story of the church by looking at the time period of the Catholic Reformation. This is the period of time when the church reforms herself in response to the Protestant Revolution. And so before we continue on in our story and find out how the church actually reformed herself, we'll begin in prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of our church and especially of the gift of the many saints that you brought to the church during this period of time. These saints, through their actions and activities, they helped to reform the church and to respond to that great event of the Protestant Revolution. We again pray, Lord, your grace may be with us to help us to imitate them, to be more Christ-like in the world and to make a defense of our faith and of our church in the modern world when she comes under attack. Help us, too, also to be a part of the authentic reform ushered in through the work of the Second Vatican Council and of our great Pope, John Paul II. We pray these things, we pray all things in Jesus' name, and let us pray together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And the Holy Spirit. Amen. So in our last session, we finished up we, with the Council of Trent. We left off at the Council of Trent, that great event that was called in the middle of the 16th century to reform the church, to help bring about an authentic reform in the church in response to the Protestant Revolution. And we talked about how the reform of the church is centered in this time period on three Ds, we called it, the Ds of doctrine, devotion, and discipline. And so we're talking now at the Council of Trent with a whole emphasis on doctrine, where the council, and also discipline, where the council goes through and reiterates the teachings of the church and also passes certain discipline canons to bring a reform on the life of the clergy back into the church. And so we left off with the third meeting of the council. We saw how the council met, or actually was, was suspended twice in its 18-year history. Really, the whole work of the council was done over about four years, but it took from the calling of it to its ending 18 years for it to complete because it was suspended twice, once for political reasons, another time for an illness that had broken out. So there were these lengthy suspensions, a four-year suspension and a 10-year suspension. But now we're finally the last meeting of the council, the third meeting, which met from 1562 to 1563. And it, this meeting was, was convened, the council was reconvened by Pope Pius IV, and it was the most productive meeting in the history of the council. They passed a, mul a multitude of decrees on the sacraments, on, they had a discussion of the hierarchical structure of the church, how the church being structured with the pope, with the pope, bishops, priests, deacons, and laity, with this divinely ordained hierarchical structure that man cannot change because it was given to us by Christ. They also passed decrees on indulgences, one of the great issues that was the, uh, the main focus of Luther's revolt in Germany. And what the, what the church father, or the council father, Sierra Trent said, was that indulgences could be granted, but they could not be granted for a donation of money. So they make clear, they reiterate again, the constant teachings of the church on the, the, the uh, and on indulgences and, and the whole doctrine of indulgences and how they can be granted by the church, but again, because of this abuse that had arisen with the use of money to then outlaw that particular practice. They also called for, and these are the two most, or three most important things this particular meeting did, was a call for the establishment of and the creation of seminaries. That each diocese was to hold, was to have a seminary where men could be sent to be trained and formed well to be good and holy priests in the church. And before this time, the training of priests was very haphazard, was done at kind of the whims of each local bishop. There was no real structured, organized way in which men were, were, were called to, to study or were led to study and form in the priesthood. So Trent kind of formalizes and organizes that process by calling for the establishment of seminaries. Also, too, in this meeting, the council calls for the promulgation of a catechism, a universal book that would be published that could be given out to priests throughout the, his, throughout the church in order that they could teach from the same document and be able to teach authentically. Because remember, we saw with the Albigensian heresy and, and even in, in Luther's revolt, just the inability of the clergy to respond necessarily properly because they didn't have... Uh -oh. 
be given to the church for and to the priests of the church and bishops so that they could teach authentically and everyone teach from the same page, in essence. The council also called for the, the renewal of the liturgy. That the liturgy should be renewed and celebrated for the most part uniformly throughout the church so there wouldn't be these great variations in the liturgy. We, we would have a unity in our celebration. The unity in our celebration would lead to a unity in faith. Now both of these items of the catechism and the liturgy would ultimately be brought to fruition through the efforts of Pope St. Pius V, and we'll talk about in a minute. The council closes in, on December 4th of 1563, after this 18-year-long period from its opening now to its closing. Pope Pius IV, who closed the council, said that Trent was one of the most important councils in the whole history of the church. He then approved and promulgated the decrees of the council. And we've talked about, though, how throughout church history, a council can meet, it can pass all kinds of documents and have all kinds of decrees, but unless the council documents are implemented, unless the unless someone takes the initiative and leads the, these documents into being, and leads them into being implemented throughout the church, then the reform won't necessarily take effect. And so how the Council of Trent and these decrees from Trent are implemented through the actions specifically of Pope St. Pius V, and through the Jesuits, and also through the rising of other great holy saints that we'll talk about here in just a moment. But St. Pius V was a great, what is known as really the father of the Catholic Reformation. He, and really he alone, is the one who brings forth the authentic renewal. Of course, he uses the Jesuits and others, but he really provides the solid, universal leadership that's needed at this time to enforce the decrees of the Council. He was a Dominican, very devoted to the Blessed Mother, and very devoted also to the Rosary. In 1566, he promulgated the catechism that we just mentioned that the Council of Trent called for. So this universal catechism that would be used throughout the Church. He also, in 1570, reformed and revised the liturgy, that the Roman Rite would be celebrated uniformly throughout the Church, with a few exceptions, other rites were allowed to be used, but he instituted this new reform in the liturgy. And this is sometimes his liturgy, with a few modifications over the centuries, is what's come to be known as the Tridentine Mass, or the way in which the Mass was celebrated prior to the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, which we'll talk more about those when we get to our time period of the new springtime. Now also, the reforms from the Council of Trent, the decrees of the Council of Trent, were implemented through the actions of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, that were founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola. St. Ignatius of Loyola, when he was 30 years old, had a great conversion experience after being wounded in battle. He resolves, while he's convalescing, to dedicate his life to Christ and to the Church. So in 1534, he founds with others the Society of Jesus. Pope Paul III will approve the order six years later in 1540. He also, early in this time, wrote the Spiritual Exercises, his great spiritual work, where he provides the, the faithful a method for, for advancing in holiness, a method that is grounded in a, in a sense of self-control and self-government. We need to control ourselves, govern our passions, govern ourselves so that we can gain holiness, we can achieve holiness and imitate the life of Christ. The spiritual exercises are full of meditations, prayers, examination of conscience, again, all oriented towards our ability to grow closer to Christ in imitation of him. St. Ignatius and his companions, they found the, the Society of St. Jesus, or the Society of Jesus, rather, to do several things. And one of the things that they wanted the society to do was, first of all, participate in the reform of the church, to be the implementers of the decrees of the Council of Trent, to go forth throughout the church, wherever she existed, and to help bring about that authentic reform taught by Trent. They also were oriented directly towards fighting heresy, wherever it erupted, in particular the Protestant heresy in Germany and in, in England and other places. We saw, too, how he formed the order specifically to be missionaries, where he wanted his, his, his soldiers, his troops, to go forth throughout